koutou katoa. O shining tō te maunga, ko Erewash te awa, ko Wheels te whenua. I tipu ai a hau i Kent te ngarani, ko Dania Johnson toku ingoa, nō rera, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I'm here today to talk to you about my doctoral research with Māori wahini, or women, in the north of Aotearoa. I'd like to suggest that engaged research such as mine can help us to gain a clearer picture of how Indigenous peoples experience the health implications of climate change, and that having this clearer and more nuanced understanding facilitates more appropriate and grounded adaptation. So just to start off with some um, background and context about my research, there's a lot of very useful scholarship on the um, health effects of climate change, of which you can see some examples on the right hand, the, sorry, the left hand side of the slide here. Um, however, um, within this scholarship, the health implications of climate change are understood almost exclusively from a biomedical and psychological perspective, where health is associated with the absence or presence of disease or disorder in an individual's physical body and well-being relates to the mental state or feelings of happiness and satisfaction. This is problematic in countries such as Aotearoa, where there are groups including indigenous peoples with very different understandings of health and well-being. While there's enormous diversity between and within indigenous populations, of course, in general, indigenous frameworks for health and or well-being are holistic, collective and relational. For example, frameworks, sorry, for example, notwithstanding the variation between and amongst iwi and hapu, and even whānau, Māori generally conceive of health and well-being to be composed of interlinked spiritual, social, emotional, and physical dimensions. Health and well-being is sustained and promoted when all elements come into balance. When whānau members engage in reciprocal relations of care involving family members, ancestors, and the non-human elements of tribal territories, which I've tried to portray in this diagram um, on the left here. A small pool of scholarship suggests that climate change is magnifying the existing challenges that Indigenous peoples encounter in maintaining their physical, spiritual, social, and emotional health, yet this literature is greatly underdeveloped. Additionally, while some literature is discussing ways that Indigenous people's physical health is impacted by climate change, it generally overlooks the varied experiences of health and climate change that exist between Indigenous groups, sorry, between groups within Indigenous populations. So my research seeks to contribute directly to this gap in scholarship. Between 2019 and 21, I did about 11 months of ethnographic fieldwork with Māori women in and near to the Kaipara Harbour catchment in Northland. I'd like to briefly describe two examples from my research that illustrates how Indigenous well-being is affected, in climate change, affected by climate change in ways that are not considered by current models for analysing the health impacts of climate change. So my first example um, illustrates impacts to social and cultural well-being. During my research, I met a number of wahini doing invaluable work to connect their urban whānau members to knowledge about their rohe or tribal territory. This includes transferring oral histories of important places on the whenua at home that helps youth to develop knowledge of their whakapapa and the feeling of belonging to a collective identity. On the slide, uh, you can see some examples from um, research participants. Um, cordial. <laughs> Maintaining awareness of one's cultural identity, I learned, is a key determinant of well-being for Māori, and especially Māori youth in the city. Many of my research participants have urban whānau members whose lives have been touched by addiction, gang membership, and violence. Participants attributed these circumstances to feelings of being lost in the absence of belonging to a place and a people. So when big sisters, aunties, and queer or elders welcome urban youth home, they play a key role in promoting or strengthening the well-being of their whānau members. Yet climate change has the potential to make sharing place-related knowledge more challenging. For example, an oral historian from the Mangakahia Valley between Whangarei and Kaikoui 
expressed concern that the creek or puna, where she shares knowledge with her urban whanau, is declining year on year through more erratic rainfall, more frequent drought, and intense localised horticultural development. Declines to creek health could make it more difficult, she worried, for younger Fano to connect to these identity-informing places and stories. Ultimately, this impact on youth's social and cultural well-being could affect the health and happiness of the wider Fano collective, both now and into the future. My second example illustrates how climate-induced risks to health and well-being are experienced unevenly within indigenous communities because of individuals' unique identities. In the first community where I worked, close to the Hokianga Harbour, women were concerned about the impact of climate change on the availability of kaimoana or seafood, yet most felt that it would not affect their ability to provide food for their whanau. It came as a surprise, therefore, when one lady stated that a decline in kaimoana with climate change would leave her wondering, how am I going to feed my family? On further investigation, I learned this wahine and her partner regularly relied on kaimoana as their main source of food during gaps in their employment as archaeologists. Other wahine in the community had regular employment or a government benefit, meaning that they were able to purchase food from the supermarket and kaimoana was just an added extra in their diets. The, the archaeologist, with her previous precarious employment and no benefit, depended on kaimoana for her food security. I asked her if she could imagine finding alternative work to improve her financial circumstances, and rather sadly she explained the many barriers that she faced, including a lack of access to a legal car to commute from her extremely rural home to work, limited qualifications, being too old to qualify for a student loan to upskill, bias against women in local jobs, and potential discrimination related to being mixed race, Māori Pākehā. As she concluded, her age, sex and race, as well as location and socioeconomic status, contributed to how she experienced the effects of climate change. So why are these observations significant for adaptation? Well, I was very encouraged this morning to learn about the tiriti led focus within the Health National Adaptation Plan and considerations around Tino Ranga Tiratanga and Manu Motuhaki, um, and also integrating Māori aspirations for health into adaptation policy. However, I feel there is a very real need to ensure that these principles are central to health adaptation in Aotearoa. All previous policy documents and guidance I have encountered on health and climate in Aotearoa approach the health impacts of climate change from a biomedical worldview in line with the majority of academic research. Although Māori are repeatedly identified as a group vulnerable to the health impacts of climate change, there's very limited consideration of the effect on spiritual or cultural dimensions of health, for example, or how different groups of Māori, elderly queer or urban takatapui youth, for example, may experience the health impacts of climate change unevenly. So I would suggest that if we were to avoid maladaptation, where adaptation policy exacerbates or introduces new vulnerabilities to climate change through failing to respond to the lived experienced effects of climate change on Māori, then we must centralise Māori worldviews, experiences and experts from the community in developing adaptation policies and strategies. The value in the type of research that I am doing then lies in its ability to act like a lens for policymakers. A lens that broadens perspectives on the health implications of climate change and makes it very clear that any adaptation pertaining to Māori communities cannot be developed in isolation, but must involve sustained engagement with a range of community members, whom are best placed to offer guidance on appropriate measures to offset the health consequences of climate change. During my research, I met many Fano members engaged in Flax Roots efforts to promote the well-being of current and future generations. And of course, these activities are already offsetting some of the health impacts of climate change that Fano discussed with me. By developing adaptation policy from the ground up, there is hope that these activities could be recognised, supported, and even integrated into adaptation strategies to help build stronger, more vibrant communities. Oops. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. 
Anyway, I'd just like to um, end by... <laughs> No, it's not going to do it. Thanking all of the organisations that were involved um, in my research project, um, all of the whānau that participated and all of you for listening. So, kia ora.